All right, welcome to the April 5th, 2017 Community Preservation Committee uh, meeting. Uh, as always, we begin with general public comment. If there are folks who are interested in speaking, and I think we might have a few folks today. So if you introduce yourself, please, and give us your address, and we're happy to hear from you. Uh, my name is Tracy Copeland. Um, I live at 49 Orchard Street, over in Ward 3. Um, I'm a carpenter apprentice. I'm a member of Carpenters Local 108 in Springfield. Um, I'm here about wage theft tonight. Uh, wage theft is rampant in the construction industry, not so much on union job sites, but in on non-union job sites in particular. Um, it affects my, my, I didn't prepare a statement, so. Uh, <laughs> contractors who engage in wage theft not only are cheating their employees, which makes life a lot harder for those of us who work for contractors who do pay their employees honest wages and benefits, um, typically also salient in my mind as a worker is contractors who engage in wage theft typically also have a disregard for the safety of their employees. Um, safety effectives also cost a lot of money. Um, it'd be great if you guys could do something about wage theft in Northampton um, to make life better for, to make job sites better for workers here, um, workers like me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. My name is Chris Chastain. I live at 360 Florence Road. Um, I'm a carpenter with Local 108. I'm retired, so I'm not scratchy for work anymore. But um, there are a lot of people who are, and uh, I would like to see the town spend its money on responsible contractors who uh, treat their workers fairly. Thank you. Yeah. Well, my name is George Schroeder. I live at 28 Columbus Avenue, and I've lived there a while now. We've been in this town for 59 years, paying taxes. I'd like to see that, though our taxes, going for competent work and to pay people a competent wage. Too often, the unscrupulous contractors will misclassify individuals so they can pay less. There are other cons they use. They will have an employee that is one week on the books. The next week, they'll be a subcontractor. Then they'll be back on the books for a while and a subcontractor. The problem with this for the city is that if that individual is hurt on the job, the city's going to be caught for the the workman's comp work because he can't have workman's comp on his own. But also, in this type of work, if I had this done to me, I couldn't be affording to have to live in this town anymore. Our taxes are really high, as you all know, and they. Sh if if we're not allowing people in this community holding contractors to a standard where the people can afford to live in this community, you're going to push the carpenters like me out of the community. Um, now, I forgot to tell you earlier, I am a 39-year member of Carpenters Local 108, and I can afford to keep our family home in this community only because I made decent wages and it was never taken from me. So I hope that you will look at this seriously and look at setting strong guidelines for contractors that require that they adhere to the labor laws and that if they don't, you will pass heavy fines on them, force them into working with you to provide their employees a competent wage for the work they're doing. So thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Any other folks for general public comment? Okay. Uh, moving along, we have one set of minutes to approve, which was the, uh, what, what was the date of the minutes? 
February 1st. February. Thank you. Move to approve. Uh, is there a second? Second. Uh, discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Right. Opposed? All right, I'm going to start with approve. Uh, moving right along to the chair's report. I don't know if folks saw uh, an email that came in from the Community Preservation Coalition that there is a act to sustain community preservation revenue which is coming up on Monday, April the 10th, uh, to the State House. Uh, and they are hoping for letters of support. I think ideally they wanted them by today, but I'm sure since the, the, um, the committee meeting is not until Monday, they will take them before that. So if folks are interested in doing that, you can go on the community preservation site. Did people get that email? Do people get the community preservation? Yeah, so some did, some did not. I wonder why we're not on that, on their email. Is that something you think? Could you check into that? That would be great. So that would so that'd be helpful. But anyway, they're looking for written testimony to support the, uh, uh, this uh, act to sustain community preservation. Um, and that's it for my report. So we're going to follow up with the three folks who spoke in the general public comment with uh, trying to keep this to about 30 minutes uh, in, uh, discussion on the fair wage uh, implementation. Uh, hopefully folks read the stuff that Sarah sent us that from the mayor that was passed by the city council, the statement, the city of uh, Northampton fair wages statement that we are now mandated to include in all of our contracts uh, that go out. And I think we'll begin with uh, Alan, uh, the city solicitor, explaining hopefully what this means and how it, what it means for us. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Alan Seawald. I'm the city solicitor in, this, uh, in Northampton. Uh, some time ago, the, the uh, uh, Folks from the uh, Worker Center and from the Carpenters Union approached the mayor, and uh, we had several meetings. Um, with regard to an issue that's been ongoing and one that was highlighted in the Gazette some time ago about uh, restaurant workers and wage theft among restaurant workers, and it is a it is an acute problem, and the mayor recognizes that. So we were approached uh, with a uh, a request that we step in because the fundamental problem is that the state, the Attorney General's office, and private lawyers are not um, doing enough to enforce the wage laws. And the, the labor folks thought that if we started at the local level and started informing uh, those industries that engage uh, in chronic wage theft, that the city is, is interested and involved, it would send the, the appropriate message. So let me just suggest a couple of things that we are hoping that you will do and some things that we don't expect you to do. We're not asking you to be a judicatory body as to who violated wage laws and who didn't violate wage laws. The entire premise here is that it's those who have been adjudicated to have violated wage laws within the last three years that we're targeting. So I hope I'm not out of line by suggesting that to some extent this is a symbolic move because the problem is that the state isn't enforcing the wage laws and so what we're saying is when they do enforce the wage laws those who are found to have violated the wage laws will have some consequences here as well and so um, essentially the consequences are as as you know we've done it in in the other contexts are that if um, a contractor has been found to be with, in violation of the wage laws, adjudicated to have been in violation of the wage laws within the last three years, that contract is going to have to post a wage bond for at least one year. Um, for those whose conduct has been so egregious that they've been debarred from state work, they would also be debarred here in Northampton. That, that's the essence of this. Um, there was a lot of discussion around the issue of who should be required to do this and how far down the food chain 
you would go. And let me give you an example. Some of the projects that are funded through this committee, such as 155 Pleasant Street, um, is money that goes to an, a nonprofit who then puts it into a project. So in other words, I believe it was 200,000 coming out of this committee to that project. That was a $20 million project. Ours was a small token of, of the, those funds. Not that small, but it was. Uh, uh, and so what the, what the labor folks would like to see us do, which I am not in favor of, is not only to require that HAP certify that HAP pays is in compliance with wage laws and has not been adjudicated to be in, in violation of wage laws within the last three years, but also to require that all the way down the line from HAP to the general contractor, to the subcontractors, to the sub-subcontractors, the upshot of which, if somebody down the line is in violation of this, we, meaning I, would be required to claw back the $200,000 from HAP. Now, if HAP is in violation of the wage laws, which I haven't, I'm not suggesting they are, but if they were, that's one thing. But for HAP to be responsible for everyone down the line, that's a whole nother thing. My concern about that is that if HAP has a contingent liability based on the conduct of someone else over whom they have no control, because HAP is not involved in that project. There's a, a subsidiary of HAP that owns the project. HAP's not involved. They put the money into the project that you gave them. And so if HAP has this contingent liability, they're never going to get a loan from a bank. And if I were to try and claw back $200,000 from HAP after they've already put it into the project, HAP would be out of business. I don't think that it's appropriate for us to put HAP in that position. I think it sends a strong message to say that we will ask the, the folks we give money to to certify that they are compliant and they have not been adjudicated to have been in violation. And um, the mayor is in support of this. The city council has passed both a policy and, uh, and, and uh, a resolution supporting this. And um, when we were approached about this committee doing something in this regard, the mayor, acknowledging the fact that you are an elected adjudicatory body, um, suggested that this would be a decision for you to make and that the mayor would not impose it on you. Next question. David? Um, well, we can all agree the wage theft is pretty pernicious and just nasty mm -hmm. uh, behavior. And uh, I'm an employer and, and, I, and it, just, it, it really bothers me right. that people would, would engage in this. What would be the problem with us simply attaching a rider, not, not asking HAP or whatever agency it is, to be a sheriff, but simply requiring them to put a legal clause in any contract that, that they that they uh, contract out for, and that any any contract that is subcontracted, that clause must follow, that 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 prohibits uh, a bad apple from getting into the into the barrel. And it doesn't make HAP into a uh, a you know a bunch of sleuths and investigators, it doesn't necessarily put a lot of liability on them, but there is that, that following uh, uh, legal obligation that, sh that will be in every contract that is associated with the project. Is that, wouldn't that be possible? It would be possible. However, HAP, as an, and just using HAP as an example, has no relationship whatsoever with the subcontractors. HAP has a relationship with another entity that owns the property, that entity has a relationship with the general contractor. The general contractor has the relationship with the subcontractor. HAP has no re relationship whatsoever with a subcontractor or a sub-subcontractor. No, I guess no, if, I, if I put a, I know that there's no formal relationship, but there's a contractual relationship that yeah. from one to, no. Right, no, down the line. From one to the next. I get, I, I, I do understand I've, I've dealt with a lot of contracts, mm -hmm. but you, you can say to a general contractor, nobody on this job can smoke. And then say to the, ne the general contractor, say to the next subcontractor, with which you, I have now no relationship. Part of my contract is to tell you that nobody can smoke. So each 
in a sense, each contractor who subcontracts becomes the, the, the enforcing agent of the further uh, sort of den rights there, right? Isn't that possible? It's possible, but your only relationship with, is with HAP. So the only party you can get the money back from is HAP. And I don't want to put HAP in that position. You have no relationship with the contractor, the subcontractor. And so, you know, it was just in, in discussing this with the mayor, some of the projects that, that are funded through your committee are important, you know, important players in this city and important partners in providing things like affordable housing. And um, given that this is more symbolic than actually, because we're not adjudicating anybody to be in violation. And, and the, the, the contractors and subcontractors that, that would be in violation are those that have already been adjudicated to be in violation. So they're not among the, the pool of, of people who have experience wage theft and experience non-enforcement of wage theft. They've already had the enforcement at the state level. So um, on balance, it didn't seem like a good idea to, to saddle nonprofits with that contingent liability that could be devastating to them. I'm curious what the discussion was around the three years. Um, three years comes and goes really quickly. <coughs> if there's not much enforcement action, chances are that. So was there some thought given or would there be any problem if this committee were to decide that it wanted to do a look back of more than three years? So that's why the mayor left it to you. Why that's it's that's that's really up to you. So what was the discussion about the three years? Because that really is a pretty short window if you're trying to impose some kind of real penalty to say you can't contract with the city if you've done this sort of thing. I don't believe we had any discussion about the length of time. That was what was suggested by the, the, the labor folks and mm -hmm. so you, you mm -hmm. went with it. Okay. Um uh, Alan, I'm, I'm uh, looking at the letter that, or statement that Sarah sent us from, uh, from the mayor, and it doesn't seem like the mayor is leaving us any choice in this. The statement that I'm seeing says the following shall be incorporated into all standard contracts. Right. And that statement says the contractor certifies that neither it nor any of its subcontractors right have been subject. That, that's, not, that's not your contract. Those are the, the contracts that Joe Cook um, oversees, the vendor contracts, the construction contracts for construction for the city. So when we contract directly with a, contr uh, um, a contractor, so to have police station built, we have a direct relationship with the contractor and we impose that on the contractor and their subcontractors. You don't have a relationship with a contractor. You only have the relationship, in, in my example, you don't have the relationship with the contractor. You have a relationship with the grantee who has a relationship with another party who has a relationship with a contractor. In, in that, that's the mayor's um, policy that, that he issued to his procurement officer for contracts that the procurement officer handles um, with vendors and with contractors. It's a little different situation. Thank you. So, Alan, we wouldn't, are you suggesting that we wouldn't include that same language in our standard contract? I don't know that Joe would approve it if we didn't. Yes, he would. He would? Yeah, that is. Your contracts are separate. Do, do we employ these on the hypothetical subcontractors who are working for the grantee, et cetera, et cetera? Do they have, uh, they just, filed with the Attorney General if they thought they were, uh, just go through the, the yeah. normal state. Right, and so uh, that's what everyone would have to do to come within this this policy because unless they're adjudicated through some other process to have violated the law, mm -hmm. then they're fine to us. Even so if, say we're not talking about half in this situation. Yep. Say we're talking about some other unnamed entity. Mm -hmm. We don't have a long relationship with them. I guess we could decide based on that whether we would grant the money or not. but. 
hypothetically, if it was a, if it was a grantee to which it was not central to a long relationship with the city, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, would there be no mechanism really for taking back uh, funds that we'd already granted if, if something came up during the process of a project? If we don't put that language in, you would be asking the grantee of your funds to certify that the grantee has not been adjudicated to be in violation for some period of time, three years, five years, whatever it is. Um, I'm not really sure I, I understand the question beyond that. I, I just, I'm not. Well, I guess I understand from your example that we wouldn't want to put this burden on hat because of this relationship that it has long term with the city. But if, if we do look, look, give, give money to an entity that goes out and goes to a contractor who has a head subcontractor or whatever. There really is no mechanism for us to take back that. No, just as there isn't today. Right. Um, and, you know, I, I use half because it's an example yeah. that we, we can all wrap our minds around. Sure. But any, I, I, would, I would expect that any project that you would fund would be a project that you have determined that this is a, not only a project, but a, but a grantee who you can support giving money to. Um, and that being the case, I would not, it's not just HAP, and not just because HAP it has a long relationship with the city and has been a long standing partner with the city, um, but any grantee who does important public work that warrants CPA funds um, shouldn't be saddled with a contingent liability for the most part, that they have no control over. Alan, I think David may have been asking whether um, the, the clause, just like there's lots of clauses in any construction contract that says you're gonna, uh, you're gonna comply with this, you're gonna comply mm -hmm. with that. Gonna, not that the liability run back to the grantee, uh, not that there'd be some kind of a clawback if the contractor doesn't follow through, but that we, require that the grantee include in the contract the contractor's agreement to comply with this stuff. And the, and without, the without a remedy. So it's, it, again, it's more just putting I, it out I, there I, that those are the expectations. I don't have a problem as so long as it's not the, the clawback remedy is the I understand, concern. believe me, I understand I know you the do. issues with clawback. <laughs> I have a question about um, another or different issue. Uh, we've been talking about adjudicated firms that <clears throat> part of the legal strategy of a lot of firms, and you know better than anybody in the room, is, is to um, sometimes have settlements that include uh, avoidance of, of adjudication of, of issues, but that are a routine part of their their, their practice and so, so as to um, uh, sort of push, push the envelope uh, a bit. And they're bad apples in those cases. Uh, they are effectively uh, breaking the law until they get caught, and then there's a the work out a settlement. Um, how how do we include those people into this prohibition? You, you don't. And there's only so much. Look, look, this is a state problem. This isn't a problem that we're going to solve. This is a problem. And and and. But can't we set the model for it, Alan? I mean, I, I you know. I'm. I'm certainly willing to look at uh, a proposal to, to do something, uh, you know, as Linda said, you know, something that is uh, more far reaching but without a remedy. I mean, it's all symbolic in that, in, in that situation. It, it, all we're doing is sending the message that we care about this. Yeah. But I think Not that we could actually. The sanctuary city statement is important, I think. Right. I think it's also important for us to take a stand. Because if we don't, then who will? And if we, if not now, when? Um, and I think that it's important for us not to, not to be silent on wage theft. It's a terrible thing, we, even if it is marginally enforceable. As, and I take your point. Um, I think the city needs to make that statement. And the the city council has, the mayor has, um, yes. the license commission has, and you're the last piece in the puzzle. Yeah. Um, Alan, if, if you don't want to have accountability up and down the line, 
then where do you where do you want to drop it? You just want to exempt the person on top, like your example of half, because the problem I have is that the language provided is the same language that's in the mayor's um, executive order, and I do want to follow David's suggestion. I do want to set a standard for the Canton. I do want to I do want to take a stand, and that language when it was in city council and I was there for a couple of the meetings I don't know if I was at every single one but at the time the council dealt with that it was realized that the actual oversight that the city council had was minimal mm -hmm. that a lot of this was in the license committee and commission and in this committee so I think we ought to, I think we ought to take a stand and I think that language that the city council has is not entirely toothless, but I would say largely toothless. And you've already kind of supported that tonight by two or three times talking about symbolic, the symbolism of it. Mm -hmm. So I want to do something that's a little bit more um, aggressive and a little bit more accountable. And I would like people actually held accountable up and down the line. <coughs> and I think it, I think we we pass these wonderful statements at City Council about um, you know City of Cambridge the other night passed a resolution to impeach Trump. Well, that's good, good for them, great move, but you know, on a practical level, where is that gonna go? With an issue like this that affects us all right now, right here and right now, we can, we can make a difference, and I think we should, and I think, I think there should be some, some accountability, um, far more because, as our friends in the construction industry keep talking about, um, you have well-meaning, intentioned people at the top, and then sometimes, not all the time, but inevitably, you're going to have situations where subcontractors are cutting corners left and right, mm -hmm. and, and nobody knows. And I think I think we should take a stand, and I think the mayor and yourself were right to recognize the unique situation of this committee. And I would hope that, that we do have stronger language than what the city council put down. And I don't know. I don't. I'm ignorant of what the license. Um, people came up with so I, I don't know I don't know what that is but I'm only concerned about this right the license commission deals directly again with it, it's not going down the line the way it is with many of your projects I mean a restaurant gets a license has to certify it gets a liquor license gonna have to certify it hasn't been adjudicated to be in violation of the wage laws within the last three years and if they have been adjudicated they're gonna have to post a bond and if they've been debarred they're gonna be debarred way it works um, I'm looking at the time uh, we had uh, first churches coming in at uh, 730 and I'm going to suggest that if it's okay with first churches you wait for at least another 15 minutes I'm not sure we'll have total resolution on this but if that's okay with you folks we'll push you back to 745 so we can get at least another 15 minutes in and then we may need to, uh, to, re to revisit this uh, Dan? How is the city contract language, or how do you interpret it to, to apply to out-of-state subs or uh, suppliers who might be international? I mean, uh, I don't know, is there any mechanism at all for that? Because, I mean, you could have wage theft in a, in a you know, the lumber, in a sawmill in Canada, and does it, you know, all, you know? There's only so far we can go, and... Um, is there any kind of... I, I, we haven't even discussed it because it's not, it was not our intention to take it that far down the line, mm -hmm. take it into It's very the common to have subs that are based in Connecticut, for instance. I mean, it is. Is there a mechanism for the attorney generals to talk to each other? Not that I'm aware of. Maybe the labor folks know more about that than I do, but I, I'm not aware of the attorney generals cooperating on, on wage theft issues. If there's no other, there, can I have another question? Uh, folks who haven't spoken, any? Questions? I did, but I'm on. I want to take it. Okay. Okay. If I if I hire a general contractor, and I say to that general contractor, I want again. I'm going to come back to my simple example. I want no smoking on the on the work site. Mm -hmm. And I come in two days later, and an electrical contractor, subcontractor, is smoking. Is a guy who's smoking. I know I don't have any contractual oversight over the electrical subcontractor. I got that. I've got no clawback, I can't sue anybody, I'm not. But the market, I mean, the, the, the employment world is the clawback agent because I'm gonna say, 
next time I'm doing any project to this general contractor is, you didn't oversee this. I'm not going to use you next time. Right. Um, or, and, the, and, the, and the general contractor is going to say to the electrical contractor, you let me down. Now I look bad in front of the, the client, I'm not going to use you next time. There is an enforcement agent, there's an enforcement quality to the marketplace. So it doesn't mean that I have to have a, a, a contractual clawback reach that would be really, I agree, completely uh, uh, you know, cumbersome to, to have and, and to implement. But, but it exists nonetheless because of the market. And um, all that I have to do is start off with the general and say, no smoking. And I want you to pass that along to every contractor you have and every contractor of that contractor and so on down the line. And if it's not there, we're not going to do business anymore. So, but my only relationship is with the general, mm -hmm. period. And yet there is this, this pastor that exists that's compelling to the subs. Um, why can't we do that? Well, I mean, in just for instance, going back to the HAP situation, um, you're two parties removed from the general there. You have no relationship with the general. It's different if I have a relationship with the general and I, I can go said, to the general. I, said, You're right. okay. I can go to the general if I have a relationship with the general contractor. I can go to the general contractor and say, well, here's the penalty. But it's different when that sub subcontractor commits a violation and I'm going not to the general, not to the property owner, but to an entity that got money from you and put it into the project. Is it? I mean, it, that's just one. I, I gave I gave the. The, the example I did because I've been in that exam that case, but okay, so let's say this, you know, let's say our particular situation, I don't know what HAP is called nowadays, anyway, I just read that they changed their yeah, name, so whatever it is. Um, but so we say to HAP, we'll give you $200,000, but here's what we want you to ask your general to pass along to every sub. They didn't hire the general. There was another entity between HAP and the general. Do you have to you, tell you whatever you say. I, it I'm going to come back with the same thing. I say so because he who pays the piper calls the tune, sure. and Hap is somehow calling the tune, right? No, you're calling the tune because for no for a little part of it for right. two hundred thousand out of a twenty million dollar thing. But we're saying if you're doing business, if you're getting our money, Hap, this rider is going to. We want you to pass this rider along. It's not binding on you, but we're going to watch and see how you do. I and guess we want highest ethical con contact from you. You know, we want we would, you don't you don't stiff your workers. If you want if you want to require certifications down the line, I don't have a problem with that. I have a problem where the penalty comes in for violation, and the penalty is you know is just too stiff on a on a project. And I and I only use this as an example um, because your rules are going to apply to everybody equally. So. You could have somebody who's an actual contractor coming in to do something on property, and they have that relationship. But we're we're, we're making rules for everybody, and the same rules are going to apply to everybody. So we also, uh, there is no mechanism. We don't really police these contracts once they're let. We would be relying on HAP to mm -hmm. come to us and say, "Oh, look, I have this problem on my contract." And they have no incentive to do that. It gets a little more complicated too because with. To use the HAP example again, we only gave them money to purchase the property. So as soon right. as the affordable housing restriction was recorded, they got their check and that CPA project was complete. And we don't, mm -hmm. we didn't actually provide any. We can use a hypothetical example where our money is going to the contract for yeah. this discussion. Yeah, sure. I mean, no. I mean, for instance, the smoking at UMass, they have very strict rules. Contractor, so nobody can smoke. You astonish how much smoking happens. And they're kicked off the job as soon as they do. They still smoke. Uh, it's 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 well meaning, but policing is, is really the hard part. Uh, Chris, um, yeah, my question is uh, thanks, Alan. Uh, my question is is, is purely um, procedural one. Uh, if we were to decide that we wanted to do something other than what the city or or um, uh, licensing has Excuse done, me. I'm going to take take off of you. Oh, please oh. do. Oh. We were down at Tick Land. Right, I think the email said watch for shit. Yeah. <laughs> I just did. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, if, 
we were to uh, attempt to do something that was didn't mirror what the city had done or what the license commission did, what would how would we go about that if we wanted to come up with our own language? I'd be happy to work with you. Okay. I mean that's that's not an issue. Okay. Uh, you know, there are limits to what you can do, but you know, as long as you don't breach those limits, I'm happy to work with you and craft some language that, that works for you. Uh, before Lisa uh, comes on, uh, folks who haven't uh, spoken, uh, Anne, uh, Julia, uh, Jack, any questions? Okay, can you stick around for just a minute? I Lisa? certainly can. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Lisa, can you introduce yourself again to us? Sure. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for giving me some time to speak. Lisa Clausen, I live at uh, 35 Harrison Avenue. Um, and I also, I work for the Carpenters Labor Management Program. And I'm gonna pass around, and I'm sorry I didn't um, have this done to get to you before the meeting, but uh, just a short memo. Um, coming on that way. I'm gonna go to it. Um, so, um, I'm not interested in symbolic uh, ordinance uh, or measure being taken, and I do, we do have some ideas about ones that are uh, more substantial in some different measures um, on that front. I do think that in the um, in the age of Trump, and that it's even more important for local um, boards to take action um, where they can over areas that they have some control over. We're going to find that the Department of Labor is going to do a lot fewer investigations um, of wage theft issues. Uh, there's going to be less money um, for state governments to do it as well as other as, as issues are going to be covered. With ICE raids happening um, uh, at an even higher level than they have in the past, it's going to leave immigrant workers in greater fear and much more susceptible to unscrupulous employers um, and workplace intimidation and, um, and not, not paying workers properly. So it's even more important for local communities to uphold protections for workers, especially when there's tax dollars that are being used on projects, making sure that there isn't then tax fraud happening in addition to workers being hurt off of it. So this memo that I have uh, just lays out a little overview for within construction. It's a slightly different industry than um, what uh, has been in the papers around the food service industry. Um, and wage stuff for us comes from not paying workers comp and safety issues like Teresa mentioned and some of the issues like George mentioned. Um, and very frequently it's also not paying workers at all. We, my organizer, one of our organizers in the local told me um, just a couple days ago he heard from some workers in Holyoke that were owed $10,000 from their contractor. And the contractor pays them a little bit and says I'll get you next week and then doesn't get you uh, you know, and then they keep coming back because they're owed money and they don't want to walk away from it and then they're owed even more money. And, and you know, Chris, uh, David, as you pointed out, this, is, this puts uh, businesses that are playing by the rules at an, a disadvantage to ones that are not playing by the rules. And it's happened in Northampton as well. Um, I, I believe when the senior center was built, there was a worker who was injured in that who fell off the roof. It was not proper safety protections. Um, and I don't think workers' comp was on it. We've uncovered cases with uh, Christopher Heights housing um, of workers being paid cash wages with, with no workers' comp on it. We have affidavits from workers attesting to that. Um, it, on the issue um, of um, oversight and who's going to have to do the work on tracking this down, we don't expect to have housing or any developer to be the one that is having to police all their jobs or a local board or a local municipality that has limited resources to do it. It's where, it's what we're asking is that there be something real and substantial and some financial repercussions for a contractor and a company that employs those contractors as well. And that, because it's a business model in construction, it's all low bid. So it's a business model to not pay the expense of workers' comp. It's a business model to not pay workers the pay the ta payroll taxes or to pay work not pay for overtime. Um, and unless there's a financial disincentive to do that, it's easier to just go with that and then get the slap on the hand when the slap on the hand comes and say, oh, sorry, won't do that again. Um, 
And so our goal is to try to, we've been working and having conversations with the city and with others and figuring out ways in which to address these issues. I, I don't have a very specific proposal. Yes, clawback and forfeiture, I think is the best, we think is the best way to address this issue. Um, but there are other ways to address it that have financial liability as well. And so in this memo, I lay out a couple of different suggestions and areas. And I'm not looking for the board to make a decision tonight. I know you guys aren't as well. But would like to be a part of a dialogue going forward with you on exploring what are different possibilities um, on what can be done. In terms of this issue of a HAP having the HAP example no control, I disagree. Um, I think, you know, HAP sets up an entity that's doing that project. That project is the one who's assessing and deciding what general contractor to hire. And the general contractor knows what subs they're hiring. And they have control and they know what kind of business and they know if the quotes are coming in really low, they kind of know why those quotes are coming in really low. Um, and so there, and there are, you know, with the smoking example, there are ways that you can write it into a contract that puts the liability um, uh, there for it. And it's really, you know, I, we think if it's not holding the, the applicant who gets the funds, the developer responsible, it's at least having something that's holding the general contractor. Because those are, the applicant is deciding what kind of general contractor to hire, and the general contractor is based on, has a history of what kinds of subs do they hire, what kinds of business decisions are being made. Um, so on, you know, uh, clawback and forfeiture and when, with good government, good jobs first, there's a lot of different um, organizations out there nationally that do a lot of work on trying to trace dollars and trying to say where government dollars are going out, have some provisions that if something goes wrong, most of the projects, 99% of them, things won't go wrong. And, and it's only going to be where there's adjudicated case of where there's been a problem that's been found. And when there's not enough state resources going into it, there's not going to be very many cases. It's not going to be a whole lot. But where that is, having some protections in there so that, there, so that there's some way to, to, to deal with the issue. But really, it's deterrent. In our opinion, it's that having that kind of language in there creates a much greater incentive of deterrent for it not to happen in the first place. So there's a variety of different ways. There's fines that could be put on it, but there's, in our opinion, there needs to be some sort of financial uh, repercussions on it. And we'd also, quite frankly, like to have there be some letter of censure that if it is found, that is public, that um, uh, is put forward to the company, the contractor, and the general contractor that says, you said there wouldn't be any wage theft, that you were gonna do oversight over it, and we found wage theft, and we're, you know, we're, we're not happy with that, that is useful to be able to use when that same contractor is going and saying to the town of Amherst, we'd like to, you know, uh, build some affordable housing there or build a new park um, in that place. Um, so I look forward to being, any questions you have, but also being a part of discussion kind of after this meeting um, about different options and ways in which to address this problem. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Lisa. Thank you. So, uh, Hearing from both Alan and Lisa that um, you are happy, is that the right word, to continue to work with us uh, in developing language so we can move forward knowing that it's not going to happen tonight. Um, and in fairness to other folks and the fact that we're running already 15 minutes behind, um, I'm going to suggest if that's all right that we move on to other items on the agenda knowing that we will revisit this probably not just once, but numerous times. Um, actually, first I thought, Alan. I, I was just gonna put out there uh, the possibility, since this is something that's gonna be ongoing, whether a subcommittee might um, be appropriate to, so you know we can all work together and not take up your, your that's a great idea. Your committee meeting time. That's great, good, thank you. And thank you, Lisa and Alan, and the three folks who spoke in the uh, public comment. You're welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting. Uh, <laughs> now I want to, Dave, did you have parting words? Just, I actually follows on what Alan said. I just would hope that there would be ongoing submission of new materials or new, new um, information regarding this uh, topic so that we can make an informed decision eventually. Okay, good. And again, thank you all for for coming in. We'll give you a moment to uh, vacate if you'd like before we move on to right. Right, next question. This is the chair nut. Have any other speakers in the state dealt with this? No, no, no.
Yeah, so there's no one else who would be turning and say what are we doing? Uh, but we could ask at the state level. Yeah, I'm wondering if we could. Right. Is there a model? Right. Mm -hmm. Both are going. Good question. Right. Both are going. Which is okay. We could also create the model and then share it out. But it would be interesting. Or if somebody else is having conversations, you know, with their friends. So is it okay with the committee that we now just shift gears and move on? Uh, that's okay? Yeah? And then we will, we will come back to this perhaps at the end of this meeting, please, we're looking at, at subcommittees. Okay, so next on the agenda is um, the request for the amendment to the First Church's window restoration project. To refresh our memory, and hopefully folks will to read this, we awarded <coughs> um, $213,000 in a cycle a year ago in our in our spring 2016 to fund two of the windows at uh, First Church, First Churches. While work has not begun, the bid has come in, and hurrah, hurrah, thank you for, for your work and bidding, uh, 31000 lower, or perhaps uh, $21,000 lower if in fact the Tiffany frame needs to be replaced. So the, uh, in that we were specific in our <coughs> approval of money that it go to those two windows and those two only, and now there's uh, either twenty one dollars or $31,000 uh, left. They are requesting uh, to expand the scope of the work to include some windows that we did not, uh, we did not fund. So we're all clear on that, yes? But, but not, not asking for an increase. In Correct. 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 Uh, so I'm assuming someone is here, or quite a few people are here perhaps, from First Churches to speak yes. to this? all of us. Great. Thank you for coming. And thank you for bearing with our agenda. Oh, no problem. Thank you for, for giving us a chance to speak. Um, do you want me to tell you who we are? Please. Okay, I'm Margie Riddle. I'm on the um, Board of Trustees of First Churches, and I wrote the letter to you. Uh, and um, the two of us, the three of us are here from the Window Restoration Committee and the Board of Trustees. That's Marsha Kennick and Bill McGee and myself. And we have Pastor Todd Weir here, and we have Chuck Whittem here, who's our project manager. Thank you. Uh, is there stuff you'd like to add, or is there? The only uh, thing that I would add is that, um, and this was a suggestion we had had from the beginning, we, we've been able to write another grant, which we haven't, um, will be uh, informed about in a couple of weeks, but by the 1st of May, um, that gave us a little bit of additional, will give us a little bit of additional money if we get it. It's from the National DA, DAR. Um, and that, that along with the bid coming in lower would allow us to do the third window, which was also one of the priority windows um, on our list. And, and refresh my memory, which is the third window that you're looking at? It's, it's sometimes called, <laughs> the people at the church call it the road to Emmaus window, but its official title is the Noli Me Tandre window. And the number of that is? Is A10. Great. Well, thank you for uh, submitting this. Uh, are there uh, questions for uh, Margaret? Folks have? Yes. I have a question because I wasn't here when the original thing came in. And so it doesn't really have any bearing on this. I just want to know the answer. Okay. Um, when is the church open to the public other than on Sunday morning? And does the public know that? And, and that was in our original grant. I'm sure, but it's, as I say, I was here. It's very much considered to be the meeting house of the town. So it's open to the public in many ways, at many times. And Pastor Todd. Just not the time. Peter, you're on the shoulder, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> bad, bad trip. I think he can give you the, the details uh, better than I can. So, in fact, we're trying to expand that right now. But um, we're, we're open to the public um, in several ways. We have about 25 groups that use our building on a monthly basis. Um, uh, and those would range from 12-step groups, environmental groups, um, music groups, The church building, groups, it's the, use the sanctuary or whatever you call it. And not, not all of them would use the sanctuary, 
Um, in the sanctuary itself, probably on a weekly basis, we would have some community group in there. Um, Senator Markey's office called us the day of his here his uh, town meeting and said, "Hey, could you accommodate 750 people for us tonight?" Um, and we did that for the community uh, and did pretty quick turnaround. And we we filled the whole building with. So we've actually filled the sanctuary three times since January 1st. But this um, sanctuary is not ever open on a regular basis, even for a limited period of time where there's something that says 9 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. and you can walk we, in there under those, or whatever it might be. We, we rarely just leave it open unattended um, because of where we are in the downtown. Um, it's a real liability for us to just leave it unattended. We're trying to open it up more often for, um, you know, uh, we have prayer times where we're open for an hour and <coughs> things like that. Um, and, and some of it's just having the volunteer resources to come down, because you really can't open it up without somebody being there. Mm -hmm. um, I was just curious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's, we, we open up a tremendous amount by appointment, and people stop by all the time. I probably do two tours a week. Um, we get tour buses from South Korea often. Um, mm. People from South Korea love Jonathan Edwards. We, we get a significant amount of tourism um, that come to see the sanctuary, so I, I do at least three or four tours a month that are just more People call ahead, they set it up, they come in the bus, or they knock on the door. So we, we'll open up for anybody, and it's it's pretty it's pretty regular. We just don't kind of leave it open just for the liability. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? I'm just astounded that the bid came in lower this many. So just. Mm -hmm. Just do you have any idea why? It's just so unusual. Well, I, I, what we think, we were astounded and very happy because it was the, it was a bid from the same person right. yeah. who made the original right. one. And so I think there are probably a lot of factors. Um, I think he wants the work. Um, but, mm -hmm. but also, we're really confident that this is going to be excellent work because he's done stained glass work for us before. So um, not, not really sure, but... Uh, <laughs> It was great news, and it's not a whole lot lower because the we're not sure about the replacement of the window frames, and that does boost it up. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks for coming in. Um, absent this additional grant that you mentioned, um, what would your plans be for the extra money? That's a great question, and I thought you were going to ask it. <laughs> so I think we'd have to go back to our committee. And we'd have to talk about what we're going to do, whether or not, because the additional grant is small, whether or not there would be some way that we could cover that additional amount of money. But, but the fact is we're cutting it really close. And we know that um, with any project, particularly a big one like this, even though we have a firm contract and so forth, it, it, things could happen. So I'm not sure that we would undertake the third window. Um, without this additional grant, but it is a small grant, so we have to talk about it. Yeah. I was on this committee when, when the committee funded the original um, renovations in the interior. Oh, right. Uh -huh. And so forth. Mm -hmm. and, and at that point, our we would have happily also included restoration of the windows had there been adequate money, but there wasn't. Right. Never enough. Um, and I voted uh, more recently for the renovation of, of the windows and again I can say quite firmly at least as far as I was concerned I would have happily included this third window in in the um, the funding had there been money for it but we have lots of there are many mouths to feed put right. it that way um, so in the fact that that you as a group have been thrifty and diligent and have come up with the ability to include the third window without asking us for any additional money um, seems to comport with our original intent of supporting the, the 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 restoration of those windows I don't think there was any there is anyone that didn't like that window who thought it should not be 
not should be should not be restored. It wasn't worthy of being restored. It was just that that, that the, the money could only go so far. Right. So um, I certainly um, uh, see the, the value of what you're proposing, uh, and I think that anything other than uh, allowing this would be to um, uh, disincentivize uh, thriftiness um, because you, you you haven't thrifted, and, and I would feel odd asking you to get the money back. Um, so um, I, I finally I would just say that, that it, it is is a it is a meeting house and not just a church. Uh, it plays a unique role in the city's history, unlike any other um, church building in the city. Um, and it I think it is for that reason that we treated it differently. The expectation, the obligations placed on those of you who are its stewards uh, is higher than on other churches as a result because you're supposed to be there. Um, you know, but but it's you know I'm reminded of if, if I were to if I were to mention the Cathedral Church of St Peter and Paul on St Albans Mound as a, as a parish church in Washington D.C. Uh -huh. you'd all go well that's interesting but if I were to say well the National Cathedral you say oh well I know the National Cathedral that's where they have all the big state funerals and this and that um, and, um, and 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 the, the the first church just sort of fills that role it has a a large ceremonial role in the city, um, sometimes for people or things that have no connection with the congregation that worships there, mm -hmm. uh, and we have to we have to respond to all, to perhaps less to the congregation but more to the city's needs because that's that's the money we're distributing. Uh, but I uh, I certainly appreciate the uh, the thoughtfulness and, and, and thriftiness that went into this proposal. At the risk of bringing things down to, to lowly numbers, uh, I just try to understand. It looks like there's about a forty thousand dollar cost of this oh, it looks like additional it. window, right? And then there's a thirty thousand or maybe twenty thousand dollar savings from our, the original estimate, right? Uh, and then there's about a seven thousand dollar grant, right? There, so that, so how does that work? It sounds like there's at least a possibly a thirteen thousand dollar gap there if, if it's only if, the, if you need to replace the frame. Uh, it, it, yes, and <laughs> and as you know from our original grant, perhaps um, because of the extensive renovations that we needed to do several years ago, the church is already carrying a pretty substantial loan that we're paying on, and so we really do not have the financial resources to just dip into something to get the money. Um, however, we we are um, supported. Uh, every year by the Jonathan Edwards Meeting House Foundation, mm -hmm. um, which is separate from the church. And they do have a certain amount of money that they can offer for projects like this that, that support the historical um, preservation of the, of the building. And so they've, they have said that they, you know, they've given us a figure of about $15,000 a year that they can come up with. So we feel like between those different things, that we could swing it, but you're right. It's I, I I mean I worked on these figures a lot, and it's impossible to get them perfect. Okay, but you do have a capacity to <coughs> bridge that gap. If, if, yes. If, uh, Other comments? Julia, is there anything you wanted to say? I know you were no. uh, quite articulate when the proposal mm -hmm. came up a year ago. Yeah. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Make a uh, let's just make sure. So other folks, folks that you introduced, is there anything you would like to add to this? Folks in the back, I think. And Todd, you're good with what you had to say. Uh, okay, so is there a motion? I'd like to move to approve the request by the first churches for the amendment of, of their restoration project to include the third window. Is there a second? Okay, discussion. I would just say that if if the grant doesn't come through or, or that the money is not available for the third window, then, you know, it's not Margaret, a contribution. Margaret has agreed to. Yeah, it's not a contribution up. to the church, but that it's for that purpose so that we could put some stipulation that it would be for the third window. And, yeah. you know. So amended. Are we under any obligation to put this tonight? Can we discuss this further? 
we could if you feel that if folks feel the need to do that. You want to put it off and try? Well, I feel like we had a lot of conversation about the merits of this window and that window. I feel like it's a little bit. Uh, I would be happy having an additional conversation about it. I'm not happy. Can we have a vote on that? Well, we have an amendment on the. Uh, we have a motion on the floor. An amendment. I, I made a motion. I accept the amendment. Yeah. Um, that's my motion as you know, make that the, the motion. But as far as delaying it goes, I, I'll, I'll, do, I'll work with the committee. Pleasure, but the motion's on the floor. Right, so the motion is, the motion is still on the, on the floor. So we need to address that. Um, other discussion on this? Well, I'm just in relation to what you just said, I'm remembering that this was in that same cycle where we bonded fairly heavily, and that was a lot of. Am I right? And that was where a lot of the conversation went. What were we bonding, and and to what extent? So we're you know, we're still playing with not exactly the the real pot of money. We're just kind of playing with funny money. Um, and I think it's worth thinking about as a result. I mean, I think it's great that there's savings, uh -huh. right? But I feel like we made a decision that these are the windows that were a priority to the public. Yeah. But now to say, well, naturally that was wrong, and this is other one. I don't know that that's wrong or right. I just I feel like I don't know what I think about it necessarily. Because um, I know that while the first churches does represent a very public use for a lot of people, for a lot of other people, it doesn't not feel like the meeting house that it was a public use. So I think it's not such a simple decision. Chris? Um, I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm more than willing to, to think about this a little longer. I, I, I'm loath to, to penalize people for, for, for um, you know, efficiency and frugality. But um, as David points out, there are a lot of mouths to feed, and uh, we are cash strapped right now. And as other David pointed out, um, we voted to fund a particular project. Um, it came in under budget, um, and those resources are now available to us to apply to other things. Um, I, 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 I want to consider that for a while, particularly as we talk about some other programs that, that uh, are going to be for us tonight and, 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 and uh, the next couple of weeks, uh, where we don't have the money to maybe go as far as we'd like to. I'm, I'm disinclined to vote tonight. David? I, I, I respect my colleagues enormously. I just, I, I, I remind perhaps myself that this budget, this project could easily have come in totally at budget um, if, um, if the, if the, 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 the um, folks who, who are pushing, who are advocating for the project have accepted a a higher bid or, or something like that, and by working with it, uh, the best bid uh, that they came in with, they're 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 coming in probably ahead, um, and um, and in a sense, I, I feel like we're punishing them for their for their um, assiduousness um, and and hard work on the project. So um, I, I see the point that I, that there are many of the things for us to spend their money on, but. It's, We've already allocated this, and it was for it was for windows, and it's how it be spent. Um, but uh, in what uh, sense are they being punished? What? In what sense are they being punished? One more time. In, what in, sense in, are they in the punished? sense that they had, we we gave them X amount of money to spend on window restoration. They came in now through their own good, good work and, and deliberations with the contractor at you know uh, X minus one. And we're saying, okay, we'll take the one um, back from you. When they, if they had come in at X, um, we would have been happy to just see the project move forward. Um, and um, we're, we're, you know, the the reason that, that I clearly recall that we didn't give them, that we didn't include the third window was the money saving. It wasn't that we disagreed with the project. Um, if because they've done their own work and have. Uh, come in with a thrifty um, solution to, to their to their need. We then say, well, okay, then we're gonna we're gonna claw back some of that money because you've been thrifty. And that that one, if I were the applicant, that would seem like a punishment. Um, but uh, it's not to denigrate any of the 
the quality of the arguments that I've heard. I, 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 uh, uh, would, I, I don't rescind the, the motion. I you know, continue to be interested in hearing at least, you know, getting a pulse for the, the, uh, the committee's uh, feelings on the project. Uh, I, the, the way I look at it is, is uh, that we're leveraging our money. That's the kind of the, the way I'm looking at this is that they save some money by their hard work and we can leverage that money to get further into the project. And I think that's a good use of the committee's money and the city's money to um, leverage that next step in the project. Well, there is one, can I add one thing? Please. Um, and I think it's um, Jack saying the thing about leveraging. The DAR grant that we applied for required that we have dedicated money before we could not apply for that grant without considerable dedicated money already. So that's exactly what we were doing. Okay, so there's um, uh, there's a, a, a motion on the table to expand the scope of the project to include an additional window. Uh, there's also concern that, uh, given the fact that a lot of folks are here to speak about other issues, that uh, we in fact may need a little more time to hear this. And I'm wondering if it's appropriate that we have a motion to uh, to vote tonight or not? Does that would that make sense? Um, I mean, I don't want to be voting if people don't feel comfortable voting tonight. and need time to think about it and want further discussion. And the fact that we have so many folks sitting here waiting patiently, I think we need to wrap this up now. So I think we can do two things: one is to vote now, or two is to vote to vote vote to uh, uh, put the put the vote off until the next meeting. Uh, and how, how shall we proceed on that? Can I make a motion to the table? Uh, please. I'll make a motion to the table. Okay. Second. Just a second. Is, is my motion is still alive, though. Yep. If, if, it, if, it, if it goes down, then we obviously are tabling it. But, uh, okay, uh, that's true. There. But if you're, so it's tabled now, so your motion would still be under consideration when we take it up again. But if it gets voted down, that would be the end of it. Well, so I'll make my motion, but. And to, to include that uh, uh, turning it down does not mean that it is uh, uh, disallowed. <laughs> I'll say <laughs> that. I feel like I, no, I, no, sorry, I didn't bring this up. Yeah, no, I feel like it's a perfectly reasonable motion that I made originally. Yeah. I feel totally informed about it, and I'm ready to vote on it, and I don't see the need to delay. But um, it, it, if the committee is not, doesn't want to vote on it tonight, then, then I suppose it, it won't, but I don't want that to permanently harm the committee. I'm prepared to okay. vote on it tonight, but if others would like more time, I want to accommodate that. Okay. I don't need the time, but I'm I'm happy to give others the time. And you don't feel comfortable withdrawing the motion at this point for us to vote on it? Could I, could I ask a, a, a sort of sense of meeting over on this side of the, the room? I wasn't here um, when, the, wasn't when, here. when this first came up. I don't feel I need more time to vote on it, but we got three folks over here that think they do, so. I, I feel the same way. I, there were, uh, there obviously were issues associated with this that I don't know what they were. Um. Well, uh, I, I think my only hesitance is I, I would like to, um, to use Jack's word, I'd like to find out if we successfully leveraged more money. Um, that David, David got it that you know it was his understanding or their understanding that they could make up the shortfall. I just I, I just want to make sure I want to be certain that if we're going to do this, it, it's going to it's going to get done. And um, uh, you know, I can. I included his. I included Jack's yeah. comments in the yeah. motion. Okay. I mean, I can I can live with that. Okay. So I think I, I'm hearing a majority is ready to vote on this issue. Tonight is that? I, I think I'm I'm I'm, I'm hearing that correct, um, David. I, I also don't think it's a punishment to First Churches uh, when we made a promise to fund two windows. To now say that we're not going to fund a third window is not any sort of breaking of a contract with them, nor a punishment for them. The discussion that I recall was that should we fund one or two windows, and and it was the Tiffany window that we were all sort of committed to 
and then it was almost a last minute thing to go with funding a second window. I also think for First Churches folks to appreciate is that we're down to next to no money for this cycle. We spent almost everything in the fall. We're down to what, 37,000 I think available uh, money. We have a project uh, request for 450,000 in this cycle. So we're dealing with, since I've been on the committee, with the, with the least amount of money that we have ever had for a funding cycle. Mm -hmm. And our cycle this round will be next to nothing. So anything that we can sort of claw back is the word for the evening. Work for the evening. Um, uh, 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 makes sense. And I, I think in no way would a no vote negate the good work that First Churches has done or our commitment to those two windows. Nor do I see this as a this as a punishment. Uh, yeah. If there's some people that just raised two, two more quick points, please. One is when we made the original when we made the original approval, it was in the context, as you mentioned, of, of putting significant dollars, bonding significant dollars. We very well could have at that moment bonded additional dollars to yeah. add this window or three more windows or some other number of windows. But we specifically decided that this was the scope that was something that was in the public interest. Um, uh, I'll leave it there. So is there any other discussion on this? I, I just want to make sure that we understand that if, if they don't go ahead with a third window, then we would ask for the remainder of the unused money back, back to the committee. I mean, that's... Yeah. Right. Actually, actually, no, we don't want to pay. Actually, just a bit on that. We're not only in a position of having very low funds in our pocket today, but we're also in a situation where going into the next cycle, some really big municipalities within the state are going to be drawing on the CPA fund, which means that every dollar in our fund moving forward is going to be closer to just a simple one-to-one -one property tax dollar that someone in Northampton has funded. We're not getting as much of a subsidy from the state as, as, as we used to, and we're certainly not going to here <coughs> that next year um, so not only does that mean it's less but it also means that I think it's even more beholden on us to identify the public very specific public interest of the dollars we spend to the citizenry any other discussion on this are, are we clear in what the motion is yes okay are we ready to vote all right, so the motion on the table, all those in favor? All those opposed? So that is a five, am I counting right? One, two, three, four, five, two, four, or was it six to three? Did you get that, Sarah? It was three, who was? Can we do that again? All those in favor? Okay, all those opposed? So the motion does not carry on a four to five vote. You got that, Sarah? So the money that is not spent on the second window will be returned. Yes, we understood meeting. that. Okay. Thank you very so much. So thank for your you time. very much for all your good work and uh, and good luck with the with Thanks. The restoration. Okay. Well, that's one of the closest votes we've ever had. Uh, moving right along. Uh, and thank you for your patience, uh, folks out there. Uh, we're going to hear now from Lathrop communities uh, regarding the invasive control. Some of us were, or a couple of us at least, right? We're going to make it out this afternoon to, to take a look. And um, you can introduce yourself and, and give us your spiel. Thank you. Okay. My name is Barbara Walbert. I'm a resident of the Lathrop communities. Um, and uh, I am the chair of the Land Conservation Committee, which has 32 resident members and works carefully and closely with staff. Here with me tonight are Tom Wright, our director of the communities, Jim Dowell, who is a resident and also the chair of the Residents Association, Fran Folkman, a resident and member of the Land Committee, and Sharon Grace, a resident and member of the land committee. We have applied to, uh, for funds to remove invasives from a portion of CR land held 
by Northampton. So it's your land, it's our land, your name is on the deed, it's your CR. We started last year with $3,000 from you in a mini grant in order to begin a three-year project of removing invasive plants from this portion of Bassett Brook. And if I may, I'd like to distribute some maps that were in the application, but it might help us to look at them in paper. So, whoop, here come these maps. You do have these in the, in the proposal, but I just have extra copies. So this map that you have in front of you shows the area of work in the large picture. It's Bassett Brook as it flows from Northampton down across our land and down into the Manhattan and then into the Connecticut River. You'll see that it flows through the Park Hill area, which is high priority for you, as well as for East Hampton. So this is an important brook. It's ecologically important. It's important to Northampton. And it's important to all of the property owners, including the city, along its route. And what's happening in Bassett Brook is that it is a beautiful area with very um, rich wildlife, but it is being invaded, as our two visitors saw tonight, by invasive honeysuckle, multiflora rose, barberry, burning bush, and Japanese stiltgrass are the main culprits, along with um, uh, bittersweet vines, which are choking the trees. So what happens in a landscape like this, when invasives take over, they crowd out the native plants without offering wildlife very much food, cover, or materials that they need for nesting and so on. So the wildlife, and this is scientific base, the wildlife significantly declines in a landscape when invasives take over. We are working with the city of East Hampton, on which part of our campus lies, and as well with Northampton. We have already started this work. We have cleared 40 acres of our forested land in East Hampton of invasives. We have gotten um, four grants and countless, actually several hundred resident hours. The low ladies out there pulling out invasives. We are committed. <laughs> and um, some uh, um, other kinds of money. So. We have committed deeply to protecting Bassett Brook. It doesn't just belong to us, it belongs to everybody. There's already been a significant contribution to it, including by you last year with a mini grant. And now we seek the funds to keep that going. It's a three year project and we'd like help in funding year two. Are there any questions, comments? Thank you. Maybe Is there other, to, uh, other folks that want to speak first from your committee or? Yes? No? Barbara speaks for us. <laughs> <laughs> may, may I take just a moment and recognize sure. Fran Bolkman, uh, Fran, who is in your, your uh, group. Uh, Fran, for anyone who doesn't know it, sat for many years in Brian's chair and was one of the founding uh, chair people of this commission. Um, and was responsible for many of the protocols, many of the eight very capable systems that we had in place. And uh, were it not for Fran, the, the CPC would not be a functional organization that it is today. And we owe her a great, great debt of gratitude for all her hard work. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Fran. Okay, discussion or questions for Lathrop? Uh, so the, uh, I have one one question the land is privately owned correct yes and the land we're talking about is also in CR so as you know that's written into the deed as well it's right. your CR okay. and Northampton holds the conservation restriction say again does Northampton hold yes the, mm -hmm. the city of Northampton okay. um, I, I would like to hear from the two folks who made the site visit can you all comment on what you saw it was you two right yes uh, anything you want to share with the committee uh, well, the difference between the, the site, the, the portion of the site that had received attention and the portion of the site that did not receive attention is extremely traumatic. Um, it, the, the bittersweet, as you, as, you, uh, as you mentioned, is just entangling things. It's a, it's a complete thicket of 
not not uniformly, but in portions completely thick of those open basins and it, it, it is really quite striking the difference. We we did start to have some discussion and, and I don't know if in the interim you've had any further thoughts about um, signage or making it a more welcoming uh, place. We, Chris and I did notice that just as we were leaving there was a, a young guy on a bike who headed right for the trails and we were certain that we had paid him to. These young guys that come for the cheap though, you know. <laughs> um, but um, I, I think there is some interest in some way to, to make it clearer that, um, that, that the public is welcome. And I understand your hesitation that these are not you know, fast and professionally manicured trails. They are what they are, but um, if they are on offer for people to use, um, it would be nice to, to make that clear somehow. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you'd had a chance to have any further thoughts about ways that might happen. Tom, as a director, do you want to address yeah. that? Good evening. Um, yeah, so we try to lead with our land and try to strike a balance between the use of that land and the use for our own residents as well as the greater community. And so I think we would also look for recommendations uh, from subcommittees or our own committee for sure about how best to integrate the land and the use of that for the open space and the trails uh, for our neighbors and for other folks in Northampton as well as East Hampton whether that's signage or you know, more publicly uh, making it available on websites, those sort of things, that I think would be very helpful and useful uh, to all. I don't think you're gonna be inundated by hordes of people uh, anxious to, but, um, but I think more could be done to make it clear that those who, who do just wanna spend a half an hour, 45 minutes, yeah. take a break, walk in a nice area, that, that they are welcome. Um, you don't you don't want uh, great great trains train loads of people going through of course but I, I don't think you're in danger of that happening. Right. And yet I can also imagine some intergenerational sort of programming that we could offer, make available uh, to outside folks who might want to come and enjoy the land, understand the land and, and so forth. So yeah, I think you're quite right. Do you have data, perhaps even anecdotal? about how many folks use the trails that are non-residents? Um, I know I do not. I see a lot of folks come on our campus every day with dogs or you know, riding bikes or just taking walks. Um, I really couldn't say for sure, but it's pretty consistent even on our Northampton campus um, that folks do make good use of our, our trails. Um, probably a handful on any given day. Uh, the weekends, might, there may be more. And parking is available for non-residents? Yes, there is some there is parking available in several sites. Uh, Chris, do you have no, I just wanted to echo um, what Linda said that the, <clears throat> the comparison between the, the land has already been worked on and the, the land has been really really quite dramatic. Um, and I'm not an expert in this to, to understand well enough, you know, what happens if you don't. Um, but I, but clearly it's it's a it's a, it's a it just looks healthier and, and, and certainly it's more easily accessible. Um, but I, you know, I have the same conundrum I do whenever we talk about um, doing work on private land. Um, uh, and I, I really do think, um, you know, accessibility, um, and not just accessibility, because clearly you are accessible, but um, uh, letting people know. I, I'm, but, you know, as we were talking about this, but I don't see in a grant of this size saying, oh, and by the way, you've got to throw up X number of signs or do whatever, because we're not talking about a huge amount of money. Um, but I do, um, I do think we have to we have to think about how holistically we can, not just on this parcel, but, but do a better uh, work of um, making these, these kinds of, of pieces of land accessible. Um, intellectually, so people, like, know that you can do I think something, at, at least for those who managed to get their way down there, at the, the, the main entrance point, there were a small sign saying, trail, 
open to the public or just something that said it's okay. Mm -hmm. Proceed. Yeah. There's a, I think I even hire incumbent, incumbency on you to do that as a private as a piece of private land than there is on the public land yeah. uh, because uh, people will, will take it that, it that that are not welcome unless they're specifically uh, made to feel welcome. So again, it doesn't have to be a big fancy thing, but we can't ordinarily be giving t uh, tax based uh, public money for private pieces of property unless there's a really special uh, level of welcome. So can I, I can just before I forget, I was very effusive in my in my praise of Fran because of my sight the sight lines. I didn't see Jack Warner here, who was the, <laughs> fa the founding the founding chair of this committee and who really uh, was herding cats in the very beginning and uh, managed to put it all together. And and really, I did, I'm sorry, I didn't see you there until somebody moved back and I thought, oh my God, unintentionally rude. Thank you very much. You were you founded this whole thing. Thank you. So I think all of us on the committee are very supportive of invasive species removal. But again, the issue is invasive species on private land, and does that serve the public recreation good? We all know, see as an, I think I'll speak for myself, but I think for all of us that we see invasive removal as a public good. Mm. But if in fact it's on inaccessible private land, then that is the concern, because there are so many conservation restrictions that are out there and if we start funding invasives on private land, then that opens up. That's a very slippery slope, as far as I, I can. Uh, as far as I can tell. Other questions that we have for Lathrop? How much money now? This one. Uh, we'll wait. This is since we're not voting on any of these proposals now. This okay. will not be a motion. Okay. Uh, maybe perhaps right. we could just wait. Okay. Wait on that. I not not much. It. Uh, because we remember we threw this into the general hopper rather than acting it on okay. it as a small grant because of, of, of questions uh, that we had. Jack? I just One of the words tonight was clawback, but I, I'd like to bring up the other word, which is leveraging. And again, this is a group that's doing a lot of labor and contributing a, a, a lot of their effort to the betterment of this plot of land. So, we're, we're getting a lot for our money because it's being leveraged by uh, a very committed group of people. So I always like to see that involvement, not just coming from, to us for money, but willing to put the work into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just thinking about the leverage uh, aspect of it. We do a lot of work with on the acquisition side uh, for a lot of huge, much bigger pieces of land and, and some of the size. and. Um, and then every so often someone comes along with, with asking for some money to, to make that final step to make it accessible, make it apparent to people that they can use it. And I think that's where we leverage, in a sense it's leveraging the big dollars with the small dollars. Um, I think uh, this you know, warms the heart of this member. Um, the, um, so I guess my question is, would you consider coming back in a future date and taking advantage of this uh, uh, enthusiasm to use public money to uh, help make that apparent. You know, I think, and I think it would be nice if it was in the water among all the groups uh, who, who manage these properties to that, that be a, something that some committee members would be happy to support. Thank you. And yeah, I would say I've never seen a more committed group of individuals uh, than I have at Lathrop, and I've been all around the country in different communities such as ours. And this by far, these are the force of nature that you would hope for you know, in many other areas. So I, I truly appreciate the work that they do, whether we have a grant or not, but the hours and the commitment that they put into it uh, certainly felt invaluable. Any other questions for the Lathrop proposal? So Lathrop folks, um, unlike the First Church, uh, you're sort of in the general hopper here, and we may or may not get around to um, uh, even discussing funding recommendations. Uh, we're going to, if there are no further questions, uh, we're going to move on to the public comment session where folks are able to comment on any of the uh, one, two, three projects that we have. Is that four? Uh, four projects. We have Lathrop, we have the uh, Conservation Commission Fund. We have the North Hampton Fair Housing Assessment, and we have the um, uh, housing project. What's that called? 
Hampshire. Thank you. Thank you, the Hampshire, Hampshire Inn. Uh, so at this point, we're going to move to the public uh, comment section for those uh, four projects. Some of you may want to speak to perhaps more than one of them. Uh, but in no particular order, since we just were on Lathrop, uh, is there anyone who would like to speak uh, to that proposal as part of this public comment section? Fran, we're looking at you. We <laughs> you may. Sure. Thanks very much. I actually really wanted to start by thanking you guys because I know what you're doing. And it's been a long time of doing a lot of really great work ever since the CPA got passed. I'm so sorry you don't have a whole lot more money because you could spend it well, I know you could. Uh, with respect to Lathrop, I, I don't think I need really to add anything except to say that it feels like everything is connected to everything else here, especially when it comes to invasive species. So what we do in our little piece of private land is going to affect public land down the stream. Uh, and we're doing our best to, to clean up that area and try to maintain this over quite a long area. Um, so I think there's good to be had there besides just on Lathrop land. Um, so that would be my, my pitch for Lathrop. Uh, the other thing I wanted to speak to is the Hampshire Inn Expansion Project um, of Valley CDC. Um, and again, I've been associated with all of this for really a long time now, 20 years or so. Um, and one of the things I've been really proud of is, is Valley CDC's record here in Northampton and of the very consistent support that they've gotten from the Community Preservation Committee and City Council here. I mean, they have done just one good project after another one. And you can, you know, I, I can School Street, Go West, Michaelman, that might have been too soon, I don't know. Uh, now the Lumber Yard. Uh, and, and, and addressing all different levels of need from family housing to homelessness and now the, uh, the enlarged uh, SRO housing that seems to be so effective. So I know that one of the highest priorities for the CPC is affordable housing. It also costs a lot. And so I hope uh, I'm grateful for what you've done so far. I'm very proud of Valley CDC record in all of this, and I hope hope that you'll be able to continue to give it support. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Fran. Uh, somebody, uh, anybody else on Lathrop? Okay. So since Fran spoke to Hampshire in expansion, uh, anybody to speak on that? Well, go ahead. And again, if you'll say your name and sure. where you're from. Uh, Hi, good evening. I'm, I'm Pat Goggins. I live at uh, Plenty Bridge Road in Northampton, and I'm here to speak on behalf of the proposal that you have before you uh, uh, from Valley CDC. And Fran <laughs> mentioned in a very thorough way uh, all of the fine work that they have uh, done and continue to do in, in our community, and they have certainly uh, come a long way in trying to address the needs of the most needy people in many ways in our community, particularly, uh, of course, with respect to, uh, to housing. Um, I think their, their record, as you're well aware of and Fran mentioned, is, is uh, a sterling one and it comes from uh, not only a community commitment but the confidence that uh, the community has uh, in the, the management of that organization and the fulfilling of their mission that they are continually addressing through a variety of projects over a long period of time. So, uh, and I think they clearly fit into the criteria that you need to consider uh, and uh, uh, as being appropriate for the use of these funds that have uh, performed so well in the community for so many years. So, I uh, recognize this, the uh, concerns that you have to fit in uh, these many requests and appropriately into the budget as uh, 
the funds allow, but this is one I think that uh, will continue to provide great benefit to the community, and I uh, strongly urge your support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. Uh, so hi everybody. Uh, I'm Jack Warner. I live at 46 Lady Slipper Lane in Florence, um, and um, I'm going to second what uh, Fran said to say thank you uh, because, like her, you know, I've been over there and I've done that, and I know that you do a lot of hard work, um, and I really appreciate that. I'm really happy you're here as a committee to make me. It's it's a great thing. Um, uh, I'll try not to repeat uh, what the others have said. So I think what I want to say is that um, for me, as someone who's been involved in affordable housing in um, North Hampton for a long time, um, when I first started getting involved when I was on the Housing Partnership, we talked about SRO housing and how important that was. And you know, it's 20 years later and we're still talking about SRO housing, SRO housing and how important it is, except we have a whole lot less of it. And that is why this project is so important. Our, our SRO housing inventory is, is just going down, 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 down. And this project is not only going to rehab uh, a building uh, that's owned by Valley, um, the, the last building uh, that they're doing a substantial rehab on, as I understand it, um, uh, but it's going to increase the number of, of SRO units. And uh, there are not that many ways to do that. Um, so this, for that reason, um, this is a really critical project and I hope you give it as much support as you possibly can. Thanks very much. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Other folks on the Hampshire end expansion? Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is oh, me. Uh, my name is Greg Rushing uh, and I live at 137 Crescent Street in Northampton um, and uh, here to speak on behalf of the Hampshire Inn as well. Um, kind of uh, you know I would certainly um, echo uh, um, Jack and uh, also thank folks in the room uh, who are helping make this whole process happen comprehensively, not just for this project. Um, and, uh, we're like to live in town uh, with the CPA, and I really appreciate the folks who had the foresight to implement it um, and really demonstrate some great projects, um, specifically to the Hampshire Inn project. Um, you know, I, I'll just say that um, I, I've taken a lot of notice over the past several months uh, of some signs, which I agree with a lot. And I, and I think the phrasing is no matter, no matter where you're from or what language you speak, or maybe, maybe even there's a version that says, we pray to, um, you're welcome here. We're glad you're our neighbor, right? We've all seen these signs. Um, my version of that sign says also, uh, uh, no matter how much money you make, <laughs> you're also welcome here, right? That's kind of my dream. And, uh, and I think Northampton um, uh, does work toward that goal um, a, a lot more um, legitimately and in a more committed way than a lot of communities in the valley, quite frankly, um, and I uh, and that's why part of why I came here um, because I saw that and uh, and I was right. It, it is here, um, you know. And this is a great example of, of how we can sort of advance that principle, which I think is really widely held uh, here in our community. I think people care um, about uh, social justice, about um, equity, about creating opportunities for everybody, um, and and that's kind of precisely what this project does is in a very technical way, I mean, using an asset that we have. And I think that's, that's the technical side of my point is that, you know, for Jack's point, this is a, a great opportunity to take um, an asset that already exists in our community, make it better for the folks who are there now, um, and then create opportunities for other folks um, without, you know, plowing out in green fields, without um, doing a big gaudy, uh, not that gaudy's bad, <laughs> but doing, a, you know, a, a more major project. Um, uh, moving the ball up the field, you know, three yards at a time is sometimes what we have to do uh, as in the affordable housing uh, area. So I, um, you know, that's kind of why I want to point it out. And thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks. Other folks on the Hampshire and expansion project? Okay. Uh, next up would be the Northampton Fair Housing Assessment. By the way, Fran used to bake home <laughs> for the entire community. She did. No, she did not. Yes, she did. <laughs> I got rides with Fran Thanks. about every time I never saw something. Good evening. 
I'm Peg Keller, Housing and Community Development Planner in the Mayor's Office, and I'm staff at Housing Partnership. And Greta Hagen is a Northampton Housing Partnership member, is passing out a couple of things. Um, so before we dive into this project, I would obviously want to express my support, <laughs> or else Joanne will never speak to me again, um, about the 82 Bridge Street project. I think it's, um, it's just blowing my mind that we can actually do something to create additional SRO units. Um, the two Pleasant Street projects I thought would be like the, the best thing that could happen in my lifetime and then all of a sudden 82 Bridge pops up. So great work on their part and uh, it's a little unfortunate that we're in the same round here together. But, um, <laughs> but I actually want to address some of your concerns about the uh, fair housing assessment. So what Greta just passed around was an article that has been circulated uh, lately about whether or not jurisdictions are actually moving forward on this effort um, in the current climate. The other piece is a memo that I got to Sarah late yesterday, so I wanted to make sure that you could see it if you hadn't yet seen it. And then um, the third and thickest document is the, the tool itself. So I really wanted just to make sure that you saw that as well, and I want to refer to something in it. And I also apologize for messing up your order here because the applicant discussion and questions being the prior meeting, I wasn't here. And one of the people that was there should have been here for the public comment, but she couldn't make it tonight, so we put her at your prior meeting. So sorry for the confusion. But, um, and we do have a couple folks here tonight that do want to address the support for this in the public comment section. but. In addition to the um, memo that I sent, I just wanted to highlight a couple of other things that um, were relayed to me that were um, concerns of yours. Um, one being this tool rather than others. You know, are there other ways to get to this information? Um, this particular template that HUD has created interfaces with everything else that we do. So. So I'm that community development block grant administrator as well. So we have to do a five-year consolidated plan and an annual action plan that incorporates all of these projects, including the fair housing piece. So the template that you have, um, it was extensively researched. There was a lot of public input across the nation that created this tool. So it's not kind of um, being implemented in isolation of anything else. The format of it then feeds into computer um, data entry for the consolidated plan and the annual action plan. So it really doesn't make sense for us to do anything else except this particular template. Um, there's also a citizen partici participation plan that's scripted by HUD with public hearings that are required and the citizen participation plan has to reference this particular tool and all the public hearing processes have to jive together. So it really is part and parcel of a lot of the other work that we do. Um, and this template le links to the HUD data and the mapping tools. So it's all really a package to aid in setting the local fair housing priorities. Um, the need for this work is kind of in your own plan as well, kind of separate from the CDBG or HUD requirements. Your own plan says that CPC funding requires consistency with fair housing. So when we get this created, then you also will be able to utilize it in order to really evaluate what that is when housing projects come forward. Um, the other question that you had was really what you were gonna learn from it, um, who will use it. So this is where I really wanted you to flip to the tool itself in the yellow post-it. And this is a description of some of the things that the tool itself looks for. And you know, just in case you don't really know what this application looks like printed out, I mean, this is it, I and mean, it's a whopper. So, so there's the narrative here, then there's the actual tool itself, and then there was the 2012 plan that we had done prior, so you could see what one looks like. And then there was a Pioneer Valley Planning Commission regional housing piece, so you could see kind of how our work would interface with that. But just to run through a couple things, and I don't want to take a whole lot of time, and I'll be happy to answer your questions, but 
So like that number one page on the yellow tab, um, access to financial services, like all these things laid out that, that we're going to be drilling down into, those will all translate into specific actions that will be utilized by a variety of groups in the community in addition to the mayor's office, the Office of Planning and Sustainability, um, providers like Valley CDC, um, other people that provide public services like Cas Latina, International Language Institute. This material is going to be really valuable in a lot of different venues, but, but as you look through some of these things, you can see how it might translate into actions. And until we really do the analysis, we're not going to really know what they are. But for example, <coughs> the access to financial services. If there are groups in the community that have um, language barriers or lack of financial literacy, for example, um, and we garner that information through this kind of research, then we'll know how to assign dollars to a specific programming. The second one, schools accessible for persons with disabilities, you know, that's a very specific research piece. Where are we at with that? Um, the capital planning activities at the city level um, actually is a little remiss in documentation of exactly what is accessible to students, um, faculty alike with disabilities. So there would, there could be very tangible things that would come out of that analysis. Um, access to publicly supported housing for persons with disabilities. Um, very much in partnership um, with the Public Housing Authority, Northampton Housing Authority, and affordable housing providers. We will go through all of these things together and see how the different entities in town can resolve the recommendations and the issues that are identified in this plan. So I'm going to stop now and um, just see if you have any questions specifically before we get to the other folks. Yeah, I think generally we don't ask questions of people making public comments, but in this case, since you weren't able to come uh, two weeks ago, I think we should sort of bend that rule a little bit. And if folks have questions for Peg, specific questions. I, I just want to thank you for, I'm so used to thinking that nothing that HUD does has any value. <laughs> 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 and uh, and uh, I'm seeing a new, or maybe it was an old HUD, uh, seeing them with new eyes, so that's very helpful to me. Thank you. The template's good. Somebody's thinking. That's amazing. Other questions for Pat? Um, one thing I think uh, at least a few of us are struggling with is this um, uh, difference, if you will, between <laughs> affordable housing and fair housing. And it's our mandate as a committee to move forward projects that deal with affordable housing. And I think affordable housing is, correct me if I'm wrong, a subset of fair housing, but fair housing includes more than just affordable housing. And, um, and, and can, can you address that? I mean, if in fact we are moving forward affordable housing, yet this is a report that would expand that and maybe not expand that, but include that, but also deal with stuff that that one could argue is not affordable housing. Um, There's a clear differentiation between affordable housing and fair housing. Um, affordable housing being kind of availability, and then you get into the whole thing of accessibility. Can people get to it? Can they apply? Are there equal opportunities across the community? Um, this is broader than that, and it really is focused on lower income populations because those population segments tend to face more challenges. But fair housing protects the rights of people in protected classes, and that's a whole lot more than low income. Um, I think your specific criteria within your plan, um, it's more of support for community housing in can people access the housing. So it's not bricks and mortar. It's much more, I don't want to say nebulous because it is specific, but the protected categories 
race, color, national origin, religion, sex, families with children, disabilities, marital status, age, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, military or veteran status, ancestry, public assistance, housing subsidies or rental assistance, genetic information. Those are the protected categories under the federal and state housing laws that this study will look at. So it's elderly, it's disabled, and I think um, the, the manifestation of it would tend to be low and more moderate income households, but it will be looking at things a little bit more broadly. Um, but to understand the fair housing and the access opportunities within the community is very much related to how we then figure out what kinds of housing we need to produce. So it's, it's very different from a production issue, but I don't think there's any question that it's not something that would be eligible for CPC funds. Other questions? Okay. okay, thank you so much. So Todd Weir, who's actually wearing another hat tonight, he's the chair of my housing partnership. <laughs> and then we also have um, John Fisher, who does fair housing work for um, what was known as Hack Housing until last week, and now it's called Wayfinders. So Todd and then John, thank you. Great, thank you. Hi, Todd Weir, 124 Mosier Street in uh, Northampton. I'm the new chair of the housing partnership. And um, I just want to touch on a couple issues that you've talked about previously tonight. Um, thinking back a couple of hours ago when you were talking about wage stuff, what, what I really heard from you and I really appreciate is uh, you were talking about your desire to put some teeth in um, that ordinance and make sure that there's real accountability and not just symbolism. And, and I was really glad to hear that. Um, I think that's the same way on the housing partnership that we feel about fair housing, is that um, it's not enough just to build housing. We want to make sure that it's accessible. We want to make sure that it's fair and that whatever uh, group of people is trying to seek housing. Um, I think we all know that affordable fair housing doesn't happen just because of the free market. It happens because people in a community are intentional and strategic and uh, really work at um, trying to create both the bricks and mortar as well as um, the opportunity for the right kind of housing and people being able to access that. So I think, I think we want to do something similar for affordable housing as you're talking about with wage stuff. The second thing I want to pick up on that you've been talking about is leverage. I think that's one of the favorite words of the night. So, so how would this $20,000 um, for a fair housing study leverage value in this community? And uh, so while bricks and mortar is really important, um, there are other ways that we can inc increase affordable housing in this community. Good information is leverage, right? If you have good information, if you have accurate information about your community, that's priceless. Um, that way you make sure that um, you're doing the right kind of housing in the right neighborhood for the needs that you have. Um, here's an example. If you look through the tool, one of the things they look at is, are there barriers to access because of zoning? Um, is it hard to create affordable housing because of zoning? Do we make it difficult for landlords to add units to their properties? And if we were to find something like that through this study, we might be able to increase the units by 40 or 50 or 60 units, which is as much as a big project that costs millions of dollars. And it wouldn't cost us anything except having the right knowledge, finding <coughs> the problem, and, and solving it. And uh, I can think of, um, you know, I'm, I'm on the uh, Friends of the Homeless Board. Um, they also are doing the, the program that you've given money to for the youth house. And one of the reasons they decided to do that is they were trying to find a gap. They found that uh, LG, especially uh, gay, lesbian, transgender youth were um, a population group that were not being served in housing. And, and we need to know those kinds of um, gaps in services so that we know what kinds of housing to create, whether it's Friends of the Homeless, uh, Valley CDC, 
I'm on their board, on their real estate committee too, so um, I don't just do windows. <laughs> but um, so, so I just think that this could be a, a really critical thing that helps leverage information and knowledge that could really help uh, you know, a variety of organizations uh, make sure that we're using our money well and really targeting in the, in the best way possible. So thanks, I appreciate uh, what you're trying to do. Um, you know, I'm, I'm here to say yes to everybody here tonight <laughs> because it's all good and we all care about all of these things. And uh, I appreciate the difficult decisions and the decreased funding environment that um, you all have to make. Um, so thanks for all of your late nights and deliberation and questions. So. Thank you, Todd. Thanks, Todd. So I guess I'm up. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is John Fisher. And actually, I probably can say I wear a number of hats in this. Um, I am a, actually a Northampton landlord. I own a rental property at 32-34 Elizabeth Street. Um, as a matter of fact, have a, an apartment in there where I stay at least part of the week. Um, I work with if I've been actually, if I've been speaking to you last week, I was said I work for HAP Housing. As of last Thursday, I now work for something called Wayfinders, uh, much the same agency, perhaps taking on a little bit more than it has in the past. I particularly work around fair housing issues, landlord tenant issues. I do a great deal of training for both landlords, tenants, uh, working with people around these kind of issues. I've worked in development in a number of areas over the past. I probably should add one more time and say, yes, I also very much appreciate Valley CDC and would like to go on the record in favor of them as well. Uh, but I'm really here to speak about, uh, about this particular proposal. Um, and one of the things that I also did is I served on a committee with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, of which that a little piece of that on fair housing is one of the things I believe Peg gave to you. But uh, we did a fairly large report. And when I was working on that committee, one of the senses I had is with these things, you get the feeling you write it, it goes on a shelf, collects dust, and nothing ever happens. I think in the past that, that has been the case. Um, things have changed, however. I'd like to echo a little bit of what Peg says. There really has been this particular tool is potentially very, very useful and for two reasons. One of them is that it is at the moment a requirement uh, that this is something that needs to be done. And this particular grant that's being asked for is clearly the best way to do it. Um, even regardless of what the next few years may have in store for us as far as administration and so forth. This is still based on fair housing laws which are real and are there uh, and do need to be complied with. Um, now the other piece of this is, is that uh, one of the things we sponsor every year is a fair housing and civil rights conference which just started. We had the pre-trainings today, it's going to be Thursday and Friday. If any of you have some time, even though we're full up, come see me. I'd be glad to slip you into it. Um, but we have people from 21 states, and we have people from HUD's Washington office, and we have people from HUD's Boston office and their New York office coming to this. And as of this afternoon, when I was in a training by HUD, sort of a state of the way things are, the very clear message was things aren't changing in terms of this. Uh, this is still something that people will need to do. So that's one part of it. The other part I just really like to quickly uh, say too is this, unlike so many other studies that have been, have been done, this could be a very, very useful tool for you for being able to finally get a much clearer idea of what the needs really are as opposed to some sort of a general sweeping statement. Um, I've been somewhat involved in, in the move, if you will, um, to the affirmatively furthering fair housing approach. And I think it's exciting, both again, because I think it's right, but also because I think it's a 
potentially very, very useful for what you're going to have to do in the future when you have to make hard choices. So I'd like to, I guess you figure I'm speaking in favor of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Sure. Brian, if, if you could, because you're, you're like, yeah. as good an expert as, as many in, in the room. Um, Brian mentioned earlier that this distinction between affordable housing and fair housing. Would it be, which is more appropriate as a model to think of it as, as uh, affordable housing is a subset within fair housing or are they like two circles in a Venn diagram? They yeah, very much so, but they very much overlap. The, the real takeaway in terms of if there is no affordable housing, there really will be no fair housing. Um, and I think to some extent, I suppose more ethically, you could say if there's no fair housing, um, it's going to also uh, interfere with affordable housing. But, but basically, for people who fall within the protected categories that are primarily looked at, um, it is extremely important that there is affordable housing. This is again, I, I, you know, in part, it's, I speak to the work that saw Valley CDC has done, some of the work that we've tried to do, um, and it isn't all just have to be large projects. It, it really is how you can do this smartly, how you can bring things together. But yes, I, I, they're inextricably linked. I would say. Are there are there individuals or groups that qualify for or come under the, the aegis of, of fair housing, whose the solution to whose housing problems would be solved through something other than um, affordability issues or by perhaps the elimination of discrimination within housing? That well, I mean, in one sense, I, there are any number of ways you could parse that. But for example, uh, if without fair housing, people are going to be people who really need affordable housing, if there's a limited amount, are going to be necessarily if you will, much less likely to have access to it. They're going to be pushed out of it. Uh, so it is an affordable housing issue. They, they are, they really are linked together. I mean, you could have a situation where hypothetically you might have somebody who, you know, whatever pulls in $4 million a year and, and kind of live anywhere, but, you know, is excluded. And you might say that's a fair housing, but not an affordable housing issue. But that's just such a small part of it. Uh, so much they are tied together. Because I know that redlining and, and so forth by banks it was, a, it was a huge issue, and these were families who could afford to to move into oh, yes. neighborhoods but were prevented from doing so because of racism. And effectively, when therefore uh, affordable housing becomes an issue for them, again, not that you had to build housing for them, but just that you had to give them the opportunity to be able to access it. And yes, historically, within um, I've gotten used to speaking to younger groups. Well, I, I think I still may have age on all of you here, but uh, certainly within my lifetime, uh, we're not talking about, uh, in quotes, the South, which we you know, talked about then. We're, we're talking about right here in these areas. There were, there were red lines, there were banks. This is, this is, this is not something that's ancient history. Yeah. Um, so I was struck by reading the previous analysis by how much of it the data is really data about the Springfield Metro and, and beyond. Mm -hmm. And I guess, I, I guess, I, is there anything mandated by HUD that has to be done on the municipal, on the city level? Or yes, I, I would, yes, or does yes. it kind of yes. be done by the that, counties also? And in fact, that's the whole point of this. If, I mean, maybe Peg could probably speak to this better than I, but. Because you did mention that, that you're working with PPC, because it does seem like it's a regional issue that needs to be. It is, well, of course, it's a regional issue, it's a national issue, it's in fact an international yeah, sure. issue, with, yeah. and so forth. But this is, we here in Northampton are a very different animal from Holyoke, from Springfield, and when you mash them together, you're not necessarily getting a good picture of. This is, again, this is why I've, I've gotten kind of, why I spent as much time as I did working on that, uh, that report because it really feels like for the first time we're able to actually begin to measure this stuff and plan adequately and that's I think what this is about. As a recipient of federal funds the city of Northampton is statutorily required to affirmatively further fair housing and have an annual action plan and carry out tasks 
that are legitimate and real and not just lip service. And communities that have done the lip service and not the real work are getting in trouble. They are being nailed by HUD and they are going to court and they have to pay back money. So it's it's a statutory municipal requirement. So because the city is the entity receiving the funds, the city has to be the entity to do the, the report, right? Well, we will, we will RFP this out. And in past years, we gave CBG money to the Mass Fair Housing Center to carry out some of the activities. So we don't necessarily do the work ourselves, but we have to make sure it gets but, but, but done. done at that level. Okay. Uh, Peg, while, while you're up here, this is mandated by um, by the feds, correct? Yes. What if we don't fund it? Then we would probably have to the sick the 2012 plan was done with CBG admin when we had a little bit more. It was six thousand dollars, and we got a legal student. So we probably would not be able to do the tool to the extent that it would have to be done um, well and i think we would i'd have to go to the mayor and say we need to either figure out the other things that i'm not going to be able to do um, but i i also wanted you to see the tool because it's a lot of work it's it's an extensive piece of work so um i don't I don't think we have the time capacity to do it in-house, and as I explained in the memo, we don't have the admin within the CDBG budget, so I'm, I'm not really sure. My comment was very similar to yours. We, it's a tough question because it seems like a great project. You know, more than anybody, we're not supposed to be funding routine municipal activities. We're supposed, we're supposed to be funding exceptional funding requests for in, in the four areas. Uh, or three of um, and yet this seems like it is a municipal responsibility, doesn't it, from, from your description? It very much is. Um, so I, I, I'm blanking now if I put in the memo. So I called Pittsfield, Springfield, Holio to see how they're doing it, and they're all funding it with CDBG. And we don't have that capability. They all get on larger awards than we do. And there's a 15%, there's actually a 20% cap on planning and admin from your HUD allocation. So we don't we don't really have any wiggle room there. We also have to pay for Allen. <laughs> so um, staff time, health benefits, city solicitor, our admin budget is gone. So if we can't find the funding here, we'll probably have to look elsewhere, and I really don't know where that would be. Could this be a matter of discussion with the council? Because it, it does seem that coming to us for what, what the federal government is already requiring the city to do as a routine expense. I mean, I, again, I, I, it looks like a great project. I'm going to vote for it. But it, it, it does, it, it's like asking the CPC to, to be subsidizing the, the city budget and that's not the intent. Well, that's an option. I mean, you you funded the housing plan earlier because we're kind of all in this together. So the CPC committee would also benefit by this plan. So I'm not sure that it's just you know it's a statutory requirement. Like it's it's a little different. I mean, we we will all be able to utilize it in our programming and policy decision making. But um, I would have to say yes. That could be a that could be a path for you. Considering they're just finishing the budget now, probably a little late for this year. <laughs> Thank you. Other folks to speak to the uh, fair housing assessment? Good to go. Okay, the last of our four projects for funding consideration is the conservation fund. Is there anyone to speak to that? No. Okay, so we are good to go on that. Thank you all for doing this. We can continue to stick around for however much longer we stick around for. Feel free to go uh, abandon us. <laughs> uh, let us at least get through the financial review, if we may.
and then we can discuss where to go from there. But I think it would be helpful to hear from Sarah uh, what the exact state of finances and what we have to spend for this for this cycle. We don't have much. Um, so we have seventy nine thousand six hundred and eighty five dollars available um, due to the the late increase in state funds. We we ticked up the how, the reserves a little bit, so there is some funding set set aside, which we probably can address it a number of ways. So and there's ten thousand of that in the affordable housing reserve and open space reserves, and then forty four thousand in the historic reserve. And everything else is undesignated. So the forty thousand has to be set aside for historic. For historic. And ten thousand has to be set aside for uh, each affordable housing and open space. Okay. So housing and open space. So forty plus ten plus ten is sixty, which really allows us nineteen thousand six hundred and eighty five unencumbered, is that correct? So there's fifteen thousand six eighty five that's undesignated. Fifteen, I'm sorry, six eighty five. Yeah. Is there forty for housing? Ten for forty four thousand. Oh, forty four. Oh, okay. Forty four for housing. Forty four for historic. For historic store. And then ten each in affordable housing. And ten for open space. Did everybody get that? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, thank you, sir. So forty-four for historic, ten for affordable housing, ten for open space, and fifteen six eight five to do as we please. And then our our bonding capacity is also very reduced. So even if the committee wanted to fund all of these applications in full, it wouldn't be possible. Okay. Yeah. About two hundred and twenty thousand. What do we have before us that qualifies as historical? Do we have anything? Yeah, the, the house, Hampshire House, for terms of renovation, I should think. Yeah, that was submitted. Some portion of that the, is the supported. Supported. Right, not the expansion, but the renovation. The renovation. That was down as affordable, as uh, not just affordable housing, but historic preservation. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, they, they submitted this book. Okay, so we are clear on that. And if for some reason we didn't want to allocate anything to open space, we could go back and amend the previous order that took open space funds from a from the undesignated account. So there, there's work around this. No matter how much. And the um, the amount of money that we will now get back from. Uh, First churches is yet to be determined because we don't know exactly what they're going to spend. And the $100,000 that theoretically we would get back from Hampshire County Courthouse, we will not uh, know until the end of September. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. So theoretically, we have another additional 130 coming in for our allotment beginning, but that's not, that's not until. So we have two things on the agenda. One is uh, to begin funding recommendations. It is 9.15. Uh, we could begin that, uh, or we could put that off until the next meeting. Uh, the other thing is to, is the other item is other business not foreseen, and one would be to go back now to the fair wage mm -hmm. implementation and at least have some clarity as to where we're going to, how we're going to proceed with that. Um, I have a, I guess, an unforeseen category. Well, mm -hmm. oh, okay. uh, well I, so what do you want? Um, I would, given the fact that we're sort of moving forward in the agenda, okay. um, I would at least suggest for my own mental health that we pass on the funding recommendations until the next meeting. Is that okay? Is anyone? Yeah. Here, here. Okay. Um, so let's move on to wait, other. Wait, sorry. Julie just asked. Uh, next meeting. When is the next meeting? Should be two weeks from today. We'll yeah. look at the schedule just to make sure. Yeah. That's, that's the key vacation. Is it? Yeah, yeah school vacation. School vacation. Yeah, we're gone. I'm gone. In, in that's the, why I was asking. In the, the past, we have.
bunk meetings before or after given yeah given school vacation week for yeah we we've, we've always had different amounts of numbers of people who were affected by school vacation so we can it, it is scheduled for the 19th but it doesn't have to be so we're losing what two yeah. one two uh what about putting it off to the 20 what would that be? 26. 26? Mm -hmm. Would that work? Any objections to April 26? April Crossing off the 19th and moving to the 26th. Good to go on that? Yes. So that's a other business not foreseen. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, uh, let's see, David, you had a, a unforeseen yeah, something just struck me about a confluence of either of really interesting dilemmas that we've been dealing with tonight. Um, with regard to the way stuff, we're talking about you know, money coming back into the coffers, you know, because of some bad apples. And then, and then, but there's this other sort of due diligence aspect of it that we're doing everything we can to make sure that everyone who works this, you know, the citizens of Northampton are dealing with it. Or, or, Compliant with the state, and, and, you know, doing the right thing, let's say. And then, you know, along comes Curtis Churches, who uh, comes along with these bids and goes to the whole digitally, you know. That, and then I understand that happens from time to time, but I'm wondering if it's ever been discussed why are we not asking applicants to come along with at least two bids, I mean, only three bids is kind of the standard, that are less than a year old or something with their application to make sure we're getting the best use of the public dollar and not have this weird dilemma of punishing or not punishing or whatever we're doing to the churches. Has that been something that's been discussed by CPA in the past? Sometimes um, they, they are able to submit bids just because people will volunteer to do it, but um, nonprofits especially aren't able to get bids for projects if the funding isn't in hand. So sometimes that's done mm -hmm. um, on the back end. I know sometimes we're the first of many public entities who made funded mm -hmm. projects, so it's, it's difficult. Yeah, sometimes it's sort of speculative, like, hey, you three contractors, would you be willing right. to come look at whatever we've got, understanding that you right. might not, this it's project also, may, may not materialize. And it's also, it seems to be much more of an issue when CPA funds are 90 or 100% of a project that, you know, it's obvious. If, the housing project is two hundred thousand dollars cheaper. It's not worth getting two hundred thousand dollars back because there's so many other people funding it. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a good point. Whenever possible, we should encourage, strongly encourage folks to be getting those three bids out. Um, I suppose we could require. Right. I mean, it seems um, like they're coming to us, and they're coming to us with the budget already. So yeah, but that's something that we need. We can keep in mind. Any other business? That yeah, on, on the issue of the that you raised of, of uh, fair housing versus uh, affordable housing, I'd, I'd like to get uh, asked if the committee agrees um, for Sarah to, to get seek advice of the Community Preservation Foundation. Is that the or is that they, the name? they don't really give legal advice. Well, I don't, maybe I, you can maybe you can let me suggest who would be a good source of information. I, I, perhaps just referring to the actual regulations or legislation. But uh, is our is our commission to serve uh, issues of of fair housing or affordable housing? Is that what, and and Brian raised the issue, and I think it's a good issue. And then secondly, um, what about this issue of routine city? budgetary expenses that we are being asked to subsidize now because this is a bit new, that level of, of um, even though, uh, I, and I found it compelling that other districts or other towns are, are you handling it this way, uh, so that nothing well, we got really it from too the illegal planning, about we it. We got it from the planning office as well. What, sorry? We got it from the planning office as well, I mean. Yeah, uh, but we need to be careful of that because, you know, when, when CPA was, or CPC or CPA was, was promoted to the citizenry, it was to, to say, you know, this is not an end run around tax uh, 
you know, around prop two and a half. This is we're not going to be using this money to do you know fill potholes and 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 uh, uh, paint schools. Uh, this this money is for new separate individual projects that you know are, are for community preservation and. And the other cities are not using CDB money. Yeah, we just heard that they're using it for this yeah, kind of CDBG money. They're using community development. Mark, they're using CDBG development block grant money, not CDA money. So no one, no one was using CPA money. Oh, okay. Um, well, then I, then okay. Thank you for the correction. But I just, I, I would like to, before I uh, reach an opinion on how to vote on this, I'd like to know how legitimate it or how reasonable that the rest of the community feels that this is uh, to be spending money on, on a, something the city has to do anyway. Right. So I think that will come up in, in when we're looking at the funding recommendation. Okay. The, the other area was that having to do with the original request of, of information about the um, if, uh, fair, fair labor, the, the mm -hmm. first, what's it called? Um, fair wage. Fair wage um, yeah. uh, question when, when Alan suggested a, a, a subcommittee or something like that. Yeah, so do we have a few minutes to that. discuss that process? Um, so it seems like uh, uh, that's going to be quite a bit of work on our, uh, for us, to figure out how to move forward. I mean, it seems like we are mandated essentially to move forward, or the mayor has really requested that we do so. So we have to come up with something. Um, and how best do people have suggestions on how best we can do that? I mean, one thing is to form a subcommittee. I don't know if we've ever had subcommittees before. Yes, we have to do the plan, the, the five-year plan. There was a subcommittee there, Jack. Um, so this is just apply, applying to projects that we fund that are construction projects. No. No. Yeah. We, we heard. We heard. We heard from construction tonight, and construction is. I didn't bring this up because I didn't think it was appropriate, but you know, because they're talking about big ticket, you know, twenty million dollar programs, stuff like that. But this gets down to, you know, the six, the six grand for, you know, hairbrushes over yeah. at, at uh, the historical society. And invasive and removal. It, well, right. I mean, they're exactly. contracting out to a firm that does. So yeah. it's, it's, I think it's from the little to the... Okay, because okay. my suggestion was going to be if it was construction, that couldn't they handle that at the, uh, the building inspector, you know, to get a construction permit? Yeah. And I wish, but, you know, a bad employer can stiff a secretary or a clerical worker just as easily as they can stiff a, a carpenter. And yeah, we'll, you know, our, our, we want to we protect them more broadly applied than just uh, construction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think the idea of a subcommittee is ultimately a good idea, but I think that there needs to be some general discussion first before a subcommittee has any I guidance, because I think there's just a, lot, of, a yeah. lot that needs to come out. And we need to give that subcommittee a some sort of direction or mandate, exactly. whereas I, yeah, just think about the range uh, scale of dollars and also just the, the type of work of just the projects that I've been reading in the, my short time you know, here that it's hard to imagine but some of them, how you would verify. Yeah. Uh, you know, not that it can't be done. Isn't the state it, supposed to be doing the verifying? Well, that's the whole problem. Yeah, yeah the that's what, I mean, that's the part that well, makes we, it feel... We're not adjudicatory. We, I mean, again, this is... Exactly. Well, that's, and, and that's so, so I'm suggesting that we yeah. have a discussion at a future meeting. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. No, no, no. Not not. Uh, so we'll see how far we get on the 26th with our funding recommendations, which theoretically with four projects mm. should not take us forever. And, and I wonder. No money. <laughs> and no money. <laughs> right. And one of the projects is $500,000. Uh, so we spent it last year. Yeah, so theoretically we could, and who knows. Um, so maybe we could see if we could get the wage staff, uh, or at least the beginning of the discussion on for the agenda for next meeting as well. Do you think that's possible, Chris? Well, I was just going to say, um, I, 
why don't we answer your question and then I'll we'll keep circle back to what I was going to ask. Okay. Sarah. So I'm, I, I will suggest that the, the, the most important business at hand is to get through our funding recommendations mm -hmm. and that we put that at the top of the agenda for the April 26th. Um, and then let's see how we proceed through that uh, and then put the, the, a, a discussion on fair wage implementation and then where to steps perhaps of where to go from there as another agenda item. I, I don't know what else we have on the 26th that we'll need to deal with, Sarah. Can That's you think that? Pretty much it. Okay. And that will be enough, probably. Would it be useful to know on the 26th whether or not there's another city that's been dealing with a the stuff that the city has been dealing with and whether they downloaded that information to to any other entity uh, so that if there's any kind of a model out there we might have something to talk about me on the wage theft yeah um, Lisa when I talked with her a few weeks ago indicated that there were a couple but only a couple and well, they weren't like I can't remember what the hell it was like Somerville and yeah it was Cambridge. yeah the, the cities as a whole but not the community preservation no no right, yeah. right yeah. Mm -hmm. so we would be the first yeah CPC to deal with that um, any other discussion no, but what I was going to ask was um, in advance of the the finance portion of the meeting can you figure out how much money we can squeeze, <laughs> that 10000 that we can squeeze out of um, open spaces? Oh, all of it. We, we can we <coughs> modify a previous order. Right. Um, but they're just take it from open space. Yeah, from so that. we go back and say, well, where we took it from the, the, the uh, undesignated fund, we're really correcting that. So you're, take it from you're the saying with, with a high degree of confidence that the, that the that the undistributed is 10,000 more than we discussed here? Yeah. Okay. So we we couldn't do it with historic because we didn't spend we it on it. Yeah, mm -hmm. but sorry. Okay. So it could be 25,000 unencumbered, 44,000 for a store, and 10,000 for affordable housing. Okay. Sorry, and I don't have to remember that. The applications are for how much? Well, 500,000 is for Well, I remember that one. The court is 20,000, and there are 563,000. Just one. Just one? No, three is for labor, and then there was, Wayne came back with another. With what? 80. 40. 40. So 563,000. 563. No. Yeah. Five, five, sixty-three. Five, sixty-three. So five hundred for the for the housing project, yeah. forty for conservation, three thousand yeah. for life and, and twenty for the twenty for the assessment. Okay, do that again. Five hundred. Five hundred thousand for the housing project yeah. plus forty thousand for the cons count. Uh, three thousand for invasives. Three thousand for twenty thousand for housing assessment. So potentially a huge shopping cart, but. When you go through and check out, you're in trouble. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to shop with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You just That's run. Through the door. What I was wondering. Do you have that option? Yeah. I read the police report. That people do that all the time. All kinds of stores without paying. Uh, any so, other? Um, so I can, I can try to look into CPA funds and fair housing plans, but I know that uh, lots of different types of housing plans have been funded. So that this doesn't seem tremendously different from that. Uh, the supplanting is a, is a different issue. If yeah. the city is mandated to do something, then that, that's a different question. And it's essentially, an well, it's a partially funded mandate. And I think we'll all be curious when we move back to the fair wage implementation discussion to hear your thoughts on that, Sarah. Because the reality is, who would this affect or affect you? And if you're the one that is following up Pot on potentially, oh, I mean, this could be a huge, a huge issue for you yeah. in terms of your time. If in fact it, it came, if came following up became part of the process as yeah. opposed to just putting it in and hoping yeah. the state followed it up, is that the differential? I, I guess, but I, I'm just, yeah. I, I, yeah. you know, I yeah. think we all need to be 
aware of that this is Sarah's job. And mm -hmm. If in fact we're saying, okay, now Sarah, on top of what you're already doing, here's yeah, you know, like follow someone, every subcontractor. Someone like just to look at Lisa's memo. Some of these things wouldn't really be a problem. I mean, the clawback is clearly a problem for for Alan, not not so much, right? Not so much for me and, until it happens. Um, mm -hmm. Retainage would be. Well, that's right. We'll we'll yeah. discuss it when we when. So Sarah, uh, were you going to look into the kind of um, supplanting the city budget maintenance of? Yes, I will do that. Thank you, Sarah. As always. Any other uh, business not foreseen when agenda was published? So move to adjourn. Move. Second. Yeah. All right. <laughs>